Thanks. I'm going to read a portion of a short story titled The Trojan War Museum. It does contain some graphic imagery of war, neither gods nor humans stinted in that department. The first Trojan War Museum was not much more than a field of remains. Dog chewed, sun bleached, and wind blown bones, some but buried, many burnt. But the Trojans prayed there, mourned their dead, told tales of their heroes, asked penance for their mistakes, pondered their ill fortune, poured their libations, killed their bulls, etc., etc., etc. There were not a lot of Trojans left, but all the same, they hoped for a better future and they believed in the gods, so they made sacrifices children, cattle, women, you name it. Enter Athena, motherless daughter, virgin version, murderer of Hector and Ajax and Arachne, at least a little bit. The dead added to the dead, she said. What do they expect us to do? Whatever the Trojans may have expected or hoped for, the gods did nothing. The first Trojan War Museum was abandoned after a flood, a fire, an earthquake, not necessarily in that order. The dark came swirling down. The city disappeared again. Sing to me now, you muses, of armies bursting forth like flowers in a blaze of bronze. Soldier, I begged for sleep, and if not sleep, death. I was willing to settle for death. Then again, I've never felt more loved. He looked at his father, a veteran, his grandfather, a veteran, his uncle, a veteran, his sister, a veteran, and he saw his future foretold, no different than birds and snakes foretelling nine more years of war. Think. Museums turn war to poetry. So too poets. So too war. You know, Athena forgot Odysseus was out there. Oh, muses. The second Trojan War Museum was built in approximately 951 BC upon the site of the first Trojan War Museum after Apollo, boy, man, beauty, sun god, far darter, Daphne, destroyer, and lover too, looked upon the empty plains dotted with the same old bones, more bleached, more burnt, more buried, more chewed, and declared it a ruin of a ruin and a dishonor. They are forgetting, he told Zeus, we must make them remember. Zeus, master of the house, lord of the lightning. You're not wrong, Zeus said. A museum run by gods is unusual, of course. Ares argued for an authentic experience, and so there was a room where one in 10 visitors was killed, and another in which vultures and maggots devoured the flesh of the rotting dead, while dogs licked up their blood, then turned upon each other. The second Trojan War Museum did not last long. The dark came swirling down again. Soldier, I had a more ordinary war. I feel lucky, really, though sometimes when I talk to other soldiers, I feel like it wasn't a real war, and so I'm not a real soldier. Think, would you rather be told how to use what you've got or be given what you want? Think, would you want Achilles' choice or wouldn't you? Think, glory? History, a place for tourists to visit. The third Trojan War Museum was built on Mount Olymp Olympus in the approximate year of 602 BC when Zeus, suddenly angry at the shifted tides of man's attention, gathered to the cloud white mountaintop those Trojan War mementos that were readily at hand. He was never one to go out of his way. Known first as Zeus's museum or Zeus's junk drawer, the collection only evolved into what came to be known as the third Trojan War Museum under the guidance of the more circumspect Athena, gray-eyed woman warrior of wisdom. The museum's labels provided insight into Athena's opinions. Achilles' armor, for example, was identified as Odysseus's armor, one from Ajax after the death of its former owner, Achilles. The last item listed and the culmination of Athena's display was noted only as horse, comma, wooden. Historians joke that Zeus brought the horse to Olympus in 22 pieces and Athena put it together in 20 just to show she could. Enter again Apollo, literally into the belly of the great wooden beast. Night and day, day and night, Apollo lay inside, golden knees curled to golden chest. He was interrupted only once when Poseidon, splitter of the sea, cracker of the coast, brother to the boss, popped his head up and in, swiveled it round, looked upon his nephew, and withdrew without comment. Some historians believe Apollo's equine confinement to be the mere equivalent of a teenage boy shutting himself in his room. Who is to say given immortality when a god hits puberty? 
But he had with him a long scroll, the first written record of Homer's war, and he was studying it, particularly his own place in it, per Homer. When finally he exited the belly of the ersatz beast, he went straight to his sister of sorts, the curator, comma, goddess Athena. The poet has made fools of us, Apollo said, except maybe you. I'll look into it, Athena said, taking the offending scroll from Apollo's hand. Soon after, on his own pilgrimage to Delphi, where, after all, should a god in search of himself go? Apollo posed his thought as a question. Has Homer made fools of us? The oracle replied, the immortal is all. And though he should have known better, Apollo heeded the words and not their meaning, taking comfort where it was not offered, at least for a while. But first Poseidon, having exited the third Trojan War Museum, unamused by Athena's celebration of her sometime favorite Odysseus, opened the fourth Trojan War Museum upon an island he'd created for the purpose. For the first time, two Trojan War Museums operated simultaneously. Poseidon arranged his island museum with sculptures and fountains, each of gold, Achilles seaside beseeching his mother, Iphigenia upon her pyre testing fate, and largest of all, not all gifts are good, Laocoon captured high above the water in the arms of Poseidon's serpent, mouth mid-scream, forever trying to prevent the future already past. The island had no plaques, no galleries of arms and armor, not even a building, just Poseidon's golden dioramas and running throughout a pack of horses, live, comma, wild. It was surprisingly poetic. There too was the iconic horse, this one gold, though it had its back to the surf so that one had to ride backward to serve as sentry to the sea. And there, one morning, just so, was Apollo, the museum's second visitor. Remember when we built the walls of Troy, he asked his uncle. Remember the rough stone and the cuts on our hands? Remember the pleasure of the task? Poseidon cupped a hand over his eyes to shadow the sun's glint off the back of the golden god. Was that the beginning, Apollo continued as he gazed out upon the water, his hands upon the horse's golden rump. In answer, Poseidon pointed a burly finger toward a dark-haired beauty, live, comma, buxom, stripped and bound to a rock on the eastern edge of the island and said, there's a girl if you want her. Then he left without another word. Apollo sat in the garden backward upon the horse for half a day. He did not like how Homer had made him screech like a lust for blood cheerleader, kill you Trojans, kill. It hadn't happened, not like that, had it? He did not like how he could not remember. It had seemed so important at the time. He disliked too how the gods seemed such ill company. If they were not friends to each other, what friends did they have? And when it came time for Apollo to depart, he transformed the maiden on the rock into one of Poseidon's horses. He thought it a kindness. Still, she died with the rest of the herd, left untended, without enough to eat. The gods are not known for their sustained interest. The dart came swirling down again. Soldier, I've never felt more significant than when I was in combat, but really I've never been more insignificant. Soldier, I think if we could have gone home together like the boys in earlier wars who were all from the same town and stayed together and fought for their homes and went back to their homes together, I think if we could have gone home together, we could have helped one another, but we got spread everywhere. The battalion was my home and I fought for it, and when I left, I didn't really have a home anymore. Tell me, who will build the memorial to those who died in a pile of the dead thrown there while still alive? Who will memorialize those shot with their hands in the air? Who will mark the grave of limbs? A lot of people are really angry. Think, shouldn't the immortals hold the world's memory? Why else immortality? Remember the overwhelming stench, the bone which did not withstand the blow, the 12 boy blood price, pl price for Patroclus's funeral pyre, the scale which weighed Hector's fate. In 1986, Apollo declared that he would open the Six Trojan War Museum, known herein for reasons soon to be apparent as 6A, it will be the book of the soldier's coded heart, Apollo told Athena. Go for it, Athena replied. I want to learn what I am willing to die for, Apollo added. Great, his sister replied. He meant to convey the soldier's experience to the non-soldier, the enemy's experience to the other enemy, the home front experience to those on the war front. He meant to exhibit the wind and the heat and the cold and the soldier's devotion, the soldier's fear, the soldier's courage, the soldier's boredom, the soldier's rage, the soldier's sadness, the soldier's interest, and the soldier's indifference. For once a god meant to understand mankind. He wanted to display the human soul, but also soldier's bones chewed by dogs. 
Apollo enlisted the interest of Olympus in his planning, and 6A turned into a research institute. This became the god's scientific age in which they conducted experiments by appearing in people's dreams and determining how best to change the course of human behavior. They conducted a test in which they saved the lives of every person engaged in battle for seven years running. It was a war without casualties. It went on without end. 6A lasted 16 years, though with not much to show for it. And still Apollo felt false. What he wanted was to be a soldier, to hold the museum of experience inside his own heart. The dark came swirling down. Baghdad, Fallujah, Ramadi, Tikrit, Apollo went to war. Think, which side did he choose? But are there only two sides? When you are immortal, how to prove that you are brave? What else to risk but your life? Whenever Apollo stepped in to save his men, fate refused his effort. They died anyway, or worse. Think, worse? Hector thought there was glory in the sight of burial mounds. He thought that men of the future looking upon them would think, there lies a man killed by Hector. And so they did sometimes. How much suffering brings the end to arrogance? Apollo went to war, and he went to war, and he went to war, and he went to war. Each time he came home, he went back. Who is the god of the IED and the RPG? Who is the god of Agent Orange and heroin and 12-year-old prostitutes? Who is the god of orders gone wrong, ill-thought, ill-executed, and ill-reported? Who is the mad god, far darter without aim, healer without healing? In the end, Achilles fought not for Agamemnon, or Helen, or Greece, nor even for Patroclus but for Patroclus' death. How to memorialize the soldiers' bodies, those carried down the hills of Gallipoli upon a flood, the soft bodies of the long dead left in the fields of Antietam, the exploded bodies of the Middle East, the constant light of the corpse fires, bodies stomped into mass graves, the symbolic soldiers chosen for the tombs of the unknown, Union soldiers in Mrs. Lee's rose garden, armies made of terracotta, trees and flowers and blocks of stone, Apollo did not care for any of these options. I'll stop there. Please welcome Malcolm Friend. Hard being tall with microphones. <laughs> um, yeah, um, first though, I, uh, I want to just thank um, Leah, and Gwen, and Adam, and everyone um, who made this conference possible this year. Um, it's been a rough, rough year for a lot of us, um, and it's good to be in the company of writers again. Um, it's weird to be doing a reading in person again, though. Uh, <clears throat> all right, okay. Um, I've been told that Puerto Ricans are very proud people. Um, I have no idea how anyone would have gotten that idea. Uh, it's not like we advertise it everywhere we go. <clears throat> um, but uh, this past Sunday, uh, July 25th, was actually uh, the 123rd anniversary of American troops um, invading Puerto Rico. Um, so that's going to be informing a lot of the work uh, I'm reading today. Um, so yeah, going to be a lot of uh, imperialism and some anti-blackness thrown in there too. Um, so if that's not something you're quite comfortable dealing with right now, please do take the space that you need. All right, um, and this first poem, um, just a little bit of context, is written from the perspective of Marcus Stroman. He's a Major League Baseball pitcher. I think he currently plays for the Mets. Um, and after the uh, 2013 World Baseball Classic, which is like now the big international baseball competition, um, he had expressed interest in playing for Team Puerto Rico. When 2017 rolled around, he changed his mind and decided to play for the US instead, was the winning pitcher in the championship game against Puerto Rico. Um, yeah, a lot going on there. Um, but when he first announced that he would be playing for the US instead, a lot of Puerto Ricans um, on the archipelago said, you know what, if he doesn't want to play for us, whatever. He's not even really Puerto Rican because he's not from here. Poem in which Marcus Stroman addresses Puerto Rico on the issue of his Puerto Rican edad revolving around a line from Tato Laviera. 
Call me a traitor, but I prefer island. Like you, distant pebble in the sea. Memory is the ocean I have to cross. The pain of this necessary voyage. Too many graves call for my bones. I understand that hope is fragile, but I'd rather not assign politics to a fastball. The bat splinters the same no matter my jersey. The small stitches still callous my fingers. That is the only purity I know. How these battered hands remind me rebelling against the mob of stars took me nowhere. These battered hands remind me rebelling is the only purity. I know how the ball stitches still callous my fingers. The bat splinters the same no matter my jersey. But I'd rather not assign politics to a fastball. I understand that hope is fragile, but too many graves call for my bones. The pain of this necessary voyage, memory, the ocean. I have to cross you, distant pebble in the sea. Call me a traitor, but I prefer island. Uh, yeah, let's stick with the 2017 World Baseball Classic, because um, I'm just here to talk to you about the international politics of baseball and not poetry, um, which also I failed to mention was the, uh, it was right after Hurricane Maria as well. Um, and this next poem deals with uh, the semifinal game uh, that Puerto Rico won against the Netherlands. Um, and for context, the Netherlands team is primarily comprised of players from Curaçao and Aruba. Uh, which were former uh, Dutch colonies, now constituent countries, whatever that means. Um, and the question that starts off this poem is a question that uh, J.P. Morosi, a reporter for MLB Network, um, asked Francisco Lindor after Puerto Rico won. Diasporican interview on nationalism and sport. Moments after the game ended, I saw you crying. Why? I am not oblivious to history or circumstance, that this will always be the colonizer's game despite bats and gloves reaching Puerto Rico before American ships invaded, that the Dutch team is just as Caribbean as ours, Curaçao, Aruba, that constituent country sounds so much like colony, that in any other circumstance, I'd be rooting for this team instead of ours, Squad full of niggas that look more like me and mine than most on our squad. Ancestors trafficked next to mine over an ocean. How wood once held us in its backed up bowels and now we clutch it in our fists that would get us killed in any other instance. That no home run or strikeout will undo a hurricane's wreckage. Stitch a colony back together, tight as a baseball. That a storm's lashing is just this empire's latest accomplice in our exodus. That Clemente shirts and Olympic jackets and flag-branded hats can't make an archipelago mine, no matter how many New Yorkans take the field, wear the flag of some ancestors once home. I know diaspora means I scatter, means I am cast away, means the ocean is more than any collection of tears, means I won't be heard no matter how hard I cheer. Diaspora can interview featuring the tourist question. You know, I was just in Puerto Rico. 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 
You know, I was just in Puerto Rico. You know, I was just in Puerto Rico. You know, I was just in Puerto Rico. You know, I was just in Puerto Rico. You know. I always forget how easily the colonizer moves through stolen land. Um, the question opening this next poem is adapted from uh, a question that Gail King asked uh, Mia Ponsetto, uh, the white woman who assaulted a black teenager after falsely accusing him of stealing her phone. Diaspora can interview on the question of race. <clears throat> Does being Puerto Rican mean you can't be racist? Listen, all I'm saying is that I've been here too many times before. I can't count how many Puerto Ricans have said race doesn't matter there. I can't count how many white Puerto Ricans I've known over the years. All I'm saying is I'm tired of Tereraise and all other forms of mestizaje bullshit, that a flag doesn't make us blood no matter how much red is spilled over it. I am still a nigga in any context who has had to listen to J-Lo say the word nigga, who has had to listen to De La Ghetto say the word nigga, who has had to listen to Fat Joe say the word nigga. Every time Terror Squad's Lean Back comes on at a function, I pray it is the censored version, and even when it is, I can still feel the echo of the word scraping at my ears. All I'm saying is that in college, a Dominican girl the same shade as me refused to believe I was Puerto Rican, even after I named my dad's birthplace of Fonse, when Negros carried makeshift drums into Barrio San Anton and played plena so loud even elites had to upset Uncle Sam by dancing to them. All I'm saying is the first time I felt seen was not through Hector Lavoe. The first time I felt seen was Maelo's fro on Esto Fue Lo Que Trajo El Barco. Was Tego's fro on El Evayarde and El Subetimao. Was El Conde singing Babaila and La Abolición. His voice skilled with skeletons pulled out of Ponce's shores. His whole body a tuning fork for every ghost not laid to proper rest. Does that answer the question? All right, two more. Um, and the two poems I'm gonna read um, are, they're focused on uh, reggaeton, which has some contentious origins, um, really has roots in uh, Anglo-Caribbean migration to Panama during, during the building of the Panama Canal, um, and springs out of Jamaican dance hall music. Um, and it gets, you know, really complicated when that music starts to get extremely popular, um, and the faces of that music start to be less and less black people. Um, and Jamaican dance hall doesn't uh, get the same commercial success. <clears throat> um, so the poem starts with three epigraphs, because I like to be doing too much sometimes. Uh, the first is from Jamaican dance hall artist uh, Buja Bantan. Uh, the reggaeton people, teeth reggae music from we and call it reggaeton. We knew they were going to be culture vultures. Uh, the second is uh, from uh, Rafa Pomon, um, his song uh, Vida Repira, Bengo de Africa. Bengo de Potoro. And the third is uh, from Kamal Brathwaite's poem, Calypso. The stone had skidded, arced, and bloomed into islands. Dispersion theory on rhythm and flow. And if the music be born of the slave ship's rot, I am a child of that music. And if the music be born of people once capital, I am a child of that music. And if the Caribbean be one archipelago, I am a child of that music. And if the music stay migrating from island to island, I am a child of that music. And if the patois be too thick for me to decipher, I am a child of that music. And if the Spanish be too quick for me to decipher, I am a child of that music. And if the sugarcane runoff buzzes into a dimbo, I am a child of that music. And if the dimbo be all I hear over a crowd, I am a child of that music. And if the dimbo me hypnotiza, draws me into a head nod, or a sway, or a pereo, I am a child of that music. And if the dimbo be so loud I am asked to turn it down, I am a child of that music. And if the dimbo rattles my bones into a percussion, I am a child of that music. 
And if each percussive blow be a wave hitting Kingston, I am a child of that music. And if each percussive blow be a wave hitting Ponce, I am a child of that music. And if each wave carry me like a stone skidding across the sea, I'm a child of that music. And I'm a child of that music, am a child of that music, am a child of that music. Every pebble splash charting the way back. A new island arcing and blooming in a sea we made our home. Prayer as Don Omar. Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga un dembo, fantasma. Echo of Santor Satan houses banged into existence, castaway music. Every night shouts and bullets bouncing off of bodies, bodies bouncing off of houses, off each other off the waves, and this is what a waya sounds like. Beach, a soundboard, breakage of sand to 332 snare, grain and drip bien pegado. When a barrio drops the bass line and lights itself like a vela, a rezo, un rosario por lo prieto, took their chains and built those santorce ten houses, took the leftover scrap metal and tricked it out into looped bling bling. Listen to the slide of their feet as they dance on the ocean's breeze. Put all their weight onto the humidity until the dimbo finally drops. Thank you. And let's welcome up Allegra. Uh, it's great to have a tall person go before me. Um, I'm Allegra Hyde, and I'm so grateful to be here, grateful that you're all here, I'm incredibly grateful to the people who have put together this incredible conference. Um, it's been an amazing experience. I'm gonna read from my debut novel, Eleutheria, which will be out in March 2022. Um, <laughs> if, if you want to see the cover, it was revealed today. Um, and this is the first time I'm reading from the finished book, so I'm, I'm nervous. Uh, I think to say a little bit about Eleutheria, it's narrated by a woman named Willa, and she was raised by doomsday prepping survivalist parents, um, but she ultimately seeks other ways of being in the world, uh, especially with respect to climate change. Among other things, she joins a group of militant environmentalists in the Bahamas, as, uh, and um, in, in doing that, uh, ultimately is um, part of an ongoing cycle of uh, idealization, or of uh, pursuing ideals and um, wrestling with uh, legacies of um, colonialism and exploitation. So I will be reading from the beginning. My father had a theory for why people went to the ocean in the summer, spent their savings, their vacation days, to plant themselves on a patch of sand within sight of the water. Even if they don't know it, my father said, what they want is to be close to death. That's what going to the ocean was, according to him, a chance to strip down and expose yourself to danger, to risk sunburn and dehydration and errant strikes of lightning, the foot slice of seashells and sand submerged needles. At the beach, you could wade out into waves that might pull you into a riptide or the jaws of a shark, or even if you only dipped your toes in the water, you'd still know you were stepping into something so vast it could engulf you 
swallow you whole. It's not that people want to die, said my father. It's just that when they go to the beach, a part of them knows deep down that they could. So afterward, when they return to their three-hour commutes and their cubicles, they return with a secret sense of survival. They feel woken up, more alert. My mother snorted when she heard this. She, like my father and I, was crouched in the dark gut of our emergency bunker, yet unfinished but stocked with canned goods, blankets, a stack of semi-automatic rifles. We were practicing what to do in the event of an electromagnetic attack. Going to the beach, said my mother, won't save you when SHTF, shit hits the fan. <laughs> my parents didn't think we needed the beach because unlike the masses, we were already alert to the horrors and dangers of the modern world. Unlike the masses, we were already prepared. So I didn't go to a beach until I was nearly 18, and then it was only a shabby artificial one near Logan Airport. I didn't go to a beach until after my parents couldn't survive themselves. And then, when I went with Sylvia, that felt different. Not like pressing in close to death, but already existing in an afterlife. Really, my father's theory didn't mean much to me until these last eight months, the ones I've had to think through what happened on the island, what happened at Camp Hope. All this time, I've had to wonder what it was we were really doing, what it was I did, and now, of course, I have hardly any time at all. Maybe I should have been thinking of my father right from the beginning. Maybe I should have thought about where I was really going when I first careened over the archipelago in a turboprop gunshot from Florida, and those islands looked to be all beach. The Bahamas scattered along the turquoise lip of the Caribbean, their coastline sandbar swirled, coral dazed, the islands so low in the water they seemed poised to hold their breath. A little more sea level rise and they'd be washed away. Already their edges were eroding, ocean swells grabbing at coastal roads, at the underbellies of beach houses not yet leveled by hurricanes. The worst of the storms had turned whole resorts to matchsticks. Their swimming pools gone green from neglect, pagodas engulfed by vegetation, hibiscus blooming in the marbled bathrooms, quail doves shitting on embroidered towers, another empire born and bowed, and yet, when I looked down from the turboprop, pressed my face to its oval window, I felt only possibility. I felt more than alive. My whole life, I've run away from my parents' way of thinking. That's what I wish people understood. Despite everything that's happened, the way everything looks, I only ever wanted to make the world better. I only ever wanted to help. You should know, too, that I recognized Eleutheria from the air. I knew the island even before the turboprop circled toward a ragged stretch of tarmac. The island bathed in the water like a fish hook, a skinny hundred miles that curved at one end, its shorelines barbed by peninsulas, baited with the green sway of sea grapes, beaches as pink and fine as spun sugar. I felt Eleutheria catch my heart and pull. My name, my full name, is Willa Marx. There's nothing in the middle. My parents must have had their reasons for the omission, though I've always considered it a sign of honesty. A middle name can lurk in a person like a bomb, a secret identity poised to pop off. I'm simply me. What I'm trying to say is I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't have time to tell you anything else, and it's important for you to hear the truth because what has been said about Camp Hope, about me, is a shadow of what really happened. Let me start with the easy parts. I was 22 when I boarded a plane and flew to Eleutheria. I was drunk on ideas. I was so drunk, in fact, that when the turboprop shuddered into a nosedive, cabin lights flickering, pilot crackling over the intercom, my limbs remained limp. While the other passengers hunched in their seats, prayers on their lips, I kept my eyes open, savoring the rush of arrival, the jarring smack of it reverberating through me. The turboprop did not land elegantly, but it landed intact. 
even so, had the plane crashed onto the island, I'd still have walked out of the wreckage, Betific. I'd been awake the length of a day, a night, and that had not yet become a problem. I was the kind of person who took exhaustion in stride, let it warp my surroundings into dreamscapes, and so far, everything had gone right. Out the airplane window, palm trees, a heat-seared tarmac, men in orange vests strolling from the steel maw of a rusted aircraft hangar. Around me, a dozen other passengers unbuckled their seatbelts. Some smiled relievedly, others wiped away tears. A woman's purse had spilled into the aisle and I helped her collect her things, though I curbed my impulse to ask if she was from Eleutheria. To get caught in conversation might break whatever spell had whisked me from Boston to the Bahamas, a spell meant to carry me on to Camp Hope. I wanted to arrive unimpeded, unburdened, slick as a fish released into the sea. If I could have, I would have traveled to the island naked. As it was, my backpack contained only a change of clothes, a passport, 65 US dollars, and my well-thumbed copy of Living the Solution, the official Camp Hope guide to transforming ourselves and saving the planet. I had the envelope from, em from Sylvia as well, but I tried not to think about it. What I thought about was Camp Hope, specifically about arriving at Camp Hope and making my life mean something. Had you watched me exit the airplane, my preoccupation would have been obvious. You would have seen a young woman who tripped over her own boots, a size too large as she entered the hangar. You might have noticed one of my overall cuffs was rolled higher than the other, that my backpack zipper gaped partially open. Back in Boston, I would have been a person your eyes glazed over on the street, shiftless, among the masses of the newly unemployed. I had an oval face, brittle yellow hair that went dark at the roots, a stub of a nose. I was thin, but not jagged, scrappy, though in an untested way, like a runaway who has only just left the house or an actor playing a role, familiar enough to forget. I'm gonna jump ahead. I burst out of the hangar into dazzling sunshine. A parking lot shimmered, woozy with heat, its perimeter rimmed by a chain link fence. In the distance, a narrow highway disappeared into a low swath of scrubland. My skin burned hot. I had living the solution churning inside me and with it the heat of my own ambition. I tended to flush in odd ways, in my fingertips mostly, though if you'd been watching, this would have been invisible. You would have seen only a pale girl striking out across a parking lot, a lost girl, harmless, or even in harm's way, easily manipulated, a rube, it was true, my official education extended only through high school, homeschooled at that, but I was not entirely inexperienced. At 22, I'd had my own unusual education. I considered myself intellectually advanced in one significant way. I was too wise for cynicism. I had outsmarted doubt. No one at Camp Hope knew I was coming. No one would know who I was when I arrived. I maintained, nevertheless, a propulsive confidence. Reaching the edge of the parking lot, I started down the side of the highway, soaking in sunshine, electrifying my body, intending only to move closer to my destination, a place in my head rather than direct view, so that if you'd been watching, you might have seen my eyes go unfocused, my chin lift, my chest tugged forward by an invisible string. Someone was watching. And that's where I will end. And our final reader is Brian Janay. Okay. Hello. Ooh, I feel tall, but. I guess only in my heart. <laughs> Love poem. All night you get up to check on the baby. 
your little niece swaddled like a perfect burrito, breathing so softly, you worry her lungs will stop if you sleep. In the morning, red-eyed and cloudy, you hand the baby to your mother, and she laughs at your worry, says she's restless when she keeps O2, though she never felt that way with you all, maybe because you were mine. You imagine her then, baby-faced in the hospital, delirious from drugs and labor, and a newborn on her chest screaming and screaming, unable to latch. And your mother, the youngest of seven, who never cared for anything in her life, somehow supposed to make it better. Okay, I'm gonna read a lot of angsty mother poems, in case you wanna know what's up. I called it Grace. It's not what I remember, but rather the, bank, the blank spaces that billow up like wind thrashing the trees. The moments between the first frenzied steps in flight and the chill of a wall at my back. The not knowing what comes after, but knowing my mother was after me. On good days, I call this absence, this blank space in the memory, grace. Imagine my mind like a photo album pulled from the ash of a fire. Know the heat blackened image is mine, not from what I can piece together through soot, but because the collapsed frame around it is home to me. Here's one where I lay face down on my mother's lap in the apartment she and my father find, found behind the Kmart by the freeway. The complex had a playground in the center where a little blonde boy called me nigger. I can still remember walking the path back home to ask what the word meant, but not what happens next with my mother. Was she about to strike or rub my back? She barely touched me, and I was always so afraid. I don't know when the sound of my name on her lips became like the slow pull of a knife now down my spine, or rather, the breathlessness of the wind sucked out of me, but it is now, was then too, when I bent my preschool body at the waist and watched the tent of my mother's shadow move between my feet. She swings, I run. I can remember my fear of the ladder up to the bunked bunk bed I never slept in, but not how in that panting moment and through the darkness of the room I got up there. I can see myself tucked into a ball on the unused comforter, my back pressed against the wall, feet pulled into my body to keep my mother from snatching me down. Can still see the triangle of light at the door, feel the sweat of knowing my mother was after me, but nothing else, nothing else at all. Too long, perhaps, I called this grace and love the will of the mind to forget what the body will always remember. She wants to be with me in these angsty poems. <laughs> uh, this next one is titled after a line from Toy Derricotte's. Uh, it's one of the telly poems. Um, I'm forgetting which one it is. Um, but the line is, say it wasn't my fault you suffered. Head anchored between your hip bones, nudging the cervix from the inside. Days the long and weary task of opening and me all too big from the start. Mother. In another era, I would have killed us both. Must I alone be blamed? I know the crease of the scar creeping up your belly. How after my brothers were pulled limb by limb from that same crater, you cradled the wound so gingerly I worried you might split apart. Mother, you don't have to forgive me. I know what it's like to refuse and still be opened. His powerful hand. No never being an option, your grandmother teaches you to turn your cheek to keep the old church mothers from kissing you dead on the lips, to wait to wipe the spittle and lipstick from your skin, to breathe so shallow that when the deacon whispers in your face, you don't smell the sour coffee he tried to hide with the mint dissolving under his tongue, to sing, I'm coming up. On the rough side of the mountain, I must hold to God his powerful hand. 
Nothing more isolating than a body. Acutely, the lines come down around us. We each trapped in our own peculiar cells, unknowable one to the other. We spend all our lives learning to read the pinch and crinkle of the skin. The limbs gesture, heads every particular angle. We may as well be divining stars. Even without gods, we beg manna and milk to be told where to go, what to do, and how to bear the yoke of our bewilderment. Please, mother, we say, tell me what you mean. Um, obligatory chatter. Um, <laughs> Uh, la, la, la. This next one is also titled with a line from The Body Keeps the Score. Um, what cannot be said, what cannot be communicated to the mother cannot be communicated to the self. It's another one that requires me to sing a little. That's all the chatter. Oh, and eventually maybe a joyful poem by the end. Mayhaps, if we don't run out of time. What cannot be communicated to the mother cannot be communicated to the self. She shows her mother the stain filling the gusset of her panties like an ink blot test. And the mother names it fine, so the girl learns to be fine and doesn't think of it. Not even years after when her breasts swell like mosquito bites and she learns, like other girls, to rinse out blood in cold water rubbing the fabric between her knuckles until her fingers grow stiff as ice. Children don't get weary, children don't get weary, children don't get weary till your work is done. But I'm tired, mama, I'm so tired, I'm so, mama, I'm so, but I'm so, so tired, I'm so tired, mama, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so, 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 so. So, my mother reads her Bible. After the minister has read the scripture and began to preach a good word, my mother circles back to the head and carries on past the pastor's delicately plucked first. Packed in the Los Angeles warehouse we called sanctuary, where we praised God so loud you could find your way to the altar through the haze of the bald-faced factory buildings blending one into the other on the other side of the unused rail tracks, sure as the elders could find their way to the prayer meet meetings hidden way back in the woods of Mississippi from the sounds of the yes lords rising to kiss the tree leaves alone. My mother, a Martin Luther among the caught up masses, trusted no one, least of all a man who would have himself anointed above her. And I had trusted my mother, had seen how she could fight the teachers who didn't think she or I was smart enough, white enough, had seen her read A Man for Filth, had heard her say she was too crazy for anyone to touch her daughter, had seen her smile at the man who hurt me and believe him when he said it wasn't my fault. And though he hadn't been talking about me, I had never seen my mother be wrong. And so when she believed him, I did too, even above myself. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. In the sixth month after your body refused to keep his secrets, you remember him, home alone with his heart disease, his old age, and wonder how long he will sit, slack and sunken before he is found. You picture his body, the ashen cold of his skin, the smell of shit and decay, a mouse scampering up the arm of the chair to bite at his eyebrows. You want this to feel good, you say. If there is a God, then this is how it will happen. You say God owes me. If you believed in peace, you'd know this is not the way, but since you've given up believing. Um, just a few more. Cool. Um, I don't know, these are all from a book that I'm imagining are love poems to my mother, are truth-telling poems, and so this is another one of the love poems. 
After I cut mine, my mother asks what I will do when she is too old to raise her arms above her head to dust the crop that grows like wild grasses leaping from her skull. This isn't the first time she's asked how I will care for her when it's time, though it's always about her hair, how I'll probably cut it off or lock it up, how after all this time and all her skill, I never acquired any of my own. Then I like to say I will take her to the hair salon as if I don't know she is asking how much and how well I love her. Sometimes I say she'd better start teaching the grandkids how to warm a hot plate and part the hair evenly at the root. Most days though, I can already see my gloved hands slippery with dye and all that stubborn gray at the base. I'll pull the wide toothed comb slowly through the length of her hair. It will almost be enough. Love poem to the motherfucker who broke into my apartment. True story. <laughs> Love poem to the motherfucker who broke into my apartment. All I'm saying is that was some good ass weed you stole. Top shelf and you better have enjoyed it. I mean, you look like you needed some flour, the way you clutched the tin against your chest and leapt down the stairs. Okay, I didn't really see you leap. I was running for my life too, after all. Me out the front door, you through the basement. The man who chased you down the street for no other reason than the frantic in me could have been my brother, but you could have been my brother too, frozen a split second, exiting my bedroom door as if you were the doe and not the semi barreling towards me. I didn't wanna call the cops on you, but you had my laptop and had been inside my bedroom, and I have been the doe my whole life, and it frightened me. They say you ditched my laptop when you started hopping fences, the sirens howling in broad daylight, pumping cortisol and adrenaline into your thighs and heart. Run, 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 forgive me. I wanted you far from me, yes, but also I want you alive and free. Um, and then one more. Last one, Against Mastery. Thank you guys uh, for being with me through all of these capital, all caps, angst poems. <laughs> Against Mastery. Give me no seat at the table. Let no trembling hands lay food on my plate. Let me lord over no one and nothing. Not the dog curled up in my bed, not the land nor children who wander through my care. Let me learn from the babies and be always laughing at my ignorance. Only humble discovery give me and keep my eyes on the pattern of bird's wings breaking the blue overhead. Let me face the ones I harm with open palms and let love be the method and measure of my worth. Keep my heart with my people and the coal glowing beneath my feet. Let me run and let the flame of my torch never go out. I am here with you to burn the house down. Keep me to this. Cut me down before you let me lose my way. Thank you. Woo!